I ask uh, one of you to please lead us in prayer, please. Stavani, can you please lead us in prayer? Good morning, ma'am. Sure. Good ma morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray. Father God Almighty, we are so very thankful to you for a new morning. For your mercies are renewed every morning and we are in your presence only by your grace and mercy. We have seen a new day and we are thankful to you for this time of togetherness of fellowship. Father, we give you glory, honor and praise for who you are, Father, and how you lead us into your word, into your truth. Abba, Father, we thank you that once again you've brought us all together, Father, and whatever we talk, whatever we learn, Whatever is from your side, Father, may it enrich us this day. Help us, help the faculty, and we thank you for bringing us to the end of the semester, Abba Father, when you have been faithfully leading us throughout this season, Abba Father. And as we are about to finish the semester, we bless everyone who was part of this team. We, we bless everyone who has learned well, and Father, and may everything that we have learned, may everything that we uh, have learned from the word may it bring glory to your name and expand your kingdom and we be well equipped to do your will on this earth guide us strengthen us by the power of your holy spirit and bless all our teachers all our teachers abundantly father as they have imparted your truth to us may we be blessed in it father and we may glorify you through our word action and deed continue to be with us continue to guide each of us and let all things be under your control as we Move on with the mentoring session, Father, let your wisdom flow. And in all things, we give you glory, honor, and praise for who you are. In Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Vani. And uh, once again, welcome everyone to this uh, uh, mentoring hour. Uh, this is the time we take to address uh, any questions that you have. It can be questions that are part of your course, something that you learned, or questions regarding your Christian life or ministry, even your faith journey, or questions and doubts that you have uh, even as you've been reading the Bible. So you can uh, type your questions in the chat section or you can unmute your mics and uh, please feel free to go ahead and ask your questions. So this time is open to all of you to ask your questions and our faculty is here. Uh, we'll do our best to uh, answer your questions and to clear your doubts. You can either uh, type your questions on the, the chat section or you can unmute your mics and go ahead and ask your questions. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Brother Rajesh. Yes. Uh, uh, let me introduce myself. I am Rajesh Rongari from uh, Raurkila, Orissa. I've just uh, actually, I am two months late to join this uh, course. So I joined in the month of October. So I don't think I will be able to finish the first semester in time. So uh, there, I have to complete, I think, uh, eight modules, isn't it, ma'am? Uh, yes, depends on how many courses that you're taking, sir. If you're just you're doing the entire uh, course for the semester, then it'll be eight modules. But if you're just choosing some relevant courses that you would like to uh, study, then it'll just be a few courses. But since you said you've taken all the eight courses uh, for yeah. the semester, okay. so I, I don't think I'll be able to complete the course in time. Uh, that is uh, November twenty fifth. So what will happen then? Uh, We'll have to will, will I be able to continue this course or it it I will be able to continue next year uh, first semester okay. I'm, I'm talking about the first semester yes out of eight courses I think I can complete maybe five or six courses so then uh, two modules will be left okay so, so it will be an incomplete so what will happen uh, if I am not able to complete the whole of the modules in this semester? Yeah, Rajesh. Um, 
so what will happen is uh, whatever you've completed will be marked as complete for you. Yeah. And the, the courses that you haven't completed, you can complete it. You know, you, you can't, I mean, this semester, when this semester ends, number 25th, all the courses will be closed. But the courses you did not complete, you can, you know, redo them next year, same time. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's not a problem. And then next semester, you can continue with, you know, the courses that happen next so, semester. Uh, so next year, uh, uh, it, I'll complete the these two uh, course, modules, or again have to again uh, uh, complete the whole of the eight modules. Uh, no, just the ones you have not completed. The okay, two, sir. just Thank the you. two. Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's all you have to do. The, whatever you complete will be you know marked as complete for you. So uh, I have one more question. Uh, it is said that the e-learning platform is free for all. Uh, but uh, those who can afford it can give uh, rupees 500 per module, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. So I think it'll be better for me if I pay the amount and do the courses. Yeah, that's entirely your choice, Rajesh. Whatever you're comfortable with, we have no. Uh, it's entirely your decision. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Rajesh, and it's a joy to have you as part of our All People's Church Bible College. And uh, we just uh, hope that you enjoy this learning experience and it will be a blessed learning experience and equip you to uh, minister effectively in God's kingdom. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. One more thing, madam, that uh, yes. actually I'm I'm employed in Rotterdam Steel Plant, so I don't get enough time to, <laughs> to go through all the courses, but I'm trying my best to do the courses, definitely. Yes, we understand, but we appreciate you taking the courses and uh, studying God's word, your passion to study God's word. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Brother Rajesh. Uh, yes, Christopher, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I have um, two questions. Uh, the first one is um, a question that has been asked before, but I just wanted to get clarity on it. Um, I just wanted to understand um, after we as human beings uh, uh, pass away, uh, where do we go? And a uh, couple of examples that I have uh, in mind are um, in the Old Testament, you know, people who were who followed uh, uh, a Christ-like uh, life and were, were close to uh, close to God, like like, like Moses, for example. Uh, where is he now? And um, uh, again, in the Old Testament, people who are not uh, who are not good people, and, and there are quite a few, as mentioned in the in the Old Testament. Um, where where are they now? Um, in the New Testament, um, uh, and um, you know, our forefathers, people who who have passed away, um, people who um, have uh, accepted. Uh, Christ as their savior, um, whether it is you know being being born again or you know if or uh, you know may have may, may even have you know been in different denominations, but I have accepted Christ as their savior. Uh, where are they now? And again, people who are, I mean, in the forefathers who are who are uh, who did not accept Christ as their uh, savior, where are they? So that is that. That's the fourth example, and then just um, uh, just in the in the in the future, um, in the millennium, uh, in, the, in the thousand year period, uh, again people who who pass away at that time, uh, where 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 do they go? And um, uh, some of them maybe some of them may have followed Christ. I mean, the devil does not exist uh, during that thousand year period, but again. Um, there may be still people who do not follow Christ and do not accept Christ. So again, in the in that example five and six, people who are uh, who follow Christ, where do where do they go? And people who, who do not follow Christ, uh, where do they go in that thousand year period? Yeah. So I just wanted to I just want clarity on those uh, on those six examples. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christopher. Uh... Yeah, um, Christopher. So um, so for each of these. Um, you know, we can call them as dispensations. Dispensations means periods of time. So we have three dispensations that you've mentioned. One is the Old Testament, before the, before the cross. Then we have 
the current dispensation where we are now, and then we're looking at the millennium. So there is a difference between the old and the new. In the Old Testament, everyone who died, uh, the peop those who believed in Je Jehovah God and those who didn't, they when they died, of course, you know, so when what is death? Death is the separation of the spirit and soul from the body. So the body decays, of course, but the spirit and soul um, would went to hell, but hell had two compartments. There was the there was Abraham's bosom, or also known as paradise, and then there it was hell, as in so Hades, so they, they went to Hades. Hades had two compartments, Abraham's bosom or paradise and hell. So that comprised Hades. So when you think about Hades in the Old Testament, two compartments, a great gulf between the two. How do we know this? When Jesus gave the example or gave the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he said the rich man was in hell, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Jesus on the cross, he told the man, the thief next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Where was paradise? It was in Hades, Abraham's bosom. So in the Old Testament, before the cross, nobody went up. No, the spirit didn't go up to heaven, but the spirit and soul would be held in one of these places, hell or Abraham's bosom, paradise. After the cross, when Jesus rose up from the dead, and when he ascended, then the Bible tells us, Ephesians chapter 4, it's, it's a quotation from the Old Testament Psalms. When he ascended upon high, he took captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So Ephesians 4, 4 through, 5, 4 through 7. So Abraham's bosom, paradise, was shifted from being in Hades to heaven. That's why in the New Testament, when you read about paradise, you read about paradise being in heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, I was caught up into the third heavens, into the paradise of God. Revelation 2, um, you see paradise being up in heaven. So that's the difference. It has to be very clear. And we have actually gone over this several times in our courses. Uh, we covered this in our course on covenants, uh, cross covenants in blood. Uh, we also, um, uh, I, I think even in Christology, we covered this. So, you know, so this will be very clear in our minds. Hades, prior to the cross, had two compartments, Abraham's bosom, paradise, as well as hell. Post the cross, paradise was taken up into heaven. So in this dispensation, which is the dispensation of the church, or the great or dispensation of the spirit or grace, you know, whatever. Uh, but now, when a believer dies, you know, so whether our forefathers or any of us today, when a believer dies, his spirit goes up directly to the Lord to be in heaven. How do we know that? Many scriptures. Paul said in Philippians 1, if I, it is better for me to die and to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So in this right now, after the cross, when a believer dies, his body decays, but his spirit and soul go up to be with the Lord. The unsaved continue as before in the Old Testament. Their spirit soul go to hell at this time. So then we understand, like we studied in our, you know, the course on uh, end times, that uh, at you know there is going to be the resurrection of the saints when Christ comes. Their spirit is reunited with the body. They ra they're raised up with glorified bodies. And uh, they're going to be with the Lord for seven years in heaven. Then there's the end of the age, the battle of Armageddon. And then the, mil the millennium begins. So millennium, in the millennium, you're going to have two kinds of people. You're going to have people with glorified bodies, the resurrected saints. You're also going to have the natural beings who have come past through the tribulation. They're entering into the millennium. And Isaiah 65 talks about people who, have, who will be born during the millennium. So life will continue during the millennium, thousand year reign of Christ, people will be born, so on, and they will die. Uh, Isaiah 65 once again talks about that. A child being a hundred years, you know, will die. So 
the ones with resurrected bodies will not die because they are going to now they have the glorified bodies but the people who natural people who passed into the millennium will procreate they will die and the same thing will happen that means their bodies will decay they're going to go either to hell those who have not received Christ or their spirits will go up into heaven and then the millennium ends Revelation 20, 20 and uh, beginning of 21 the, <clears throat> the millennium ends uh, with the great white throne judgment right so there at the great white throne judgment there is every person it's Revelation 20 verses 50 uh, 13 14 every person who ever lived will be standing before the throne so once again and that's the division the sheep and the goats right Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 25 so the the sheep and the goats are already separated there's already believe in Christ but every person will be raised back to life and then those who have rejected Christ will now hell itself will be cast into a lake of fire Revelation 20 verse 15 and then there's going to be the renovation of the earth everything will be destroyed with fire second Peter 3 Revelation 21 1 and 2 there'll be new heavens and new earth so we enter into the middle uh, into the new heavens new earth with glorified bodies is that okay so to answer your question uh, Old Testament was different everybody went into Hades but they were kept in two separate compartments this dispensation believers go straight up into heaven no, those are not saved. Continue as before. Millennium, uh, there will be those who won't die because we have glorified bodies. Those who do die, same thing happens. And then it all ends with the great white throne judgment where every person who ever lived will stand before the throne of God. Is that okay, Christopher? Yeah, th thank you, Pastor. I, I probably have to just go to the recording again and just uh, get, get it again because I think it's it's quite a, it's quite a heavy... Uh, um, answer um i just just one real one related question uh, what are these uh, the third heaven um what are the first and second please so if you could just mm -hmm. start you on that yeah so it's paul writes you know it's like on this 12 he talks about the third heaven so uh, there are a couple you know uh, so there are a couple of ways to look at this uh so obviously if there's a third heaven there's a first and the second so um the the Bible, you know, uses the word heaven or heavens, uh, you know, Old Testament and New Testament. So sometimes it's used in a singular heaven. Sometimes it's used in a plural heavens, implying that there's more than one heaven. And then by the usage, meaning the context and how that word is used, we understand this. And so what I'm saying right now is basically uh, a, a, a summary of the usage of the word heaven so one the word heaven in the Bible is used to refer just to the atmospheric heavens so you know we talk about the clouds you know for example as high as the heavens are above the earth so in that case the heavens are the atmospheric heavens talking about the clouds and so on so as the rain comes down from the heaven and waters the earth that heaven is the atmospheric heaven talking about the clouds and so on so that's the atmospheric heaven uh, or if you want to talk about it you can use the word celestial Paul uses that in first Corinthians 15 and he says there is one kind of heavenly bodies and then there is the body of the earth so it's again talking about the what we would say atmospheric or cosmic the cosmos the the space heavens is used that way in the beginning God created the heavens space cosmic cosmos so that's the first you know we can refer to the atmospheric heaven or the physical universe heavens the second is the heavenlies uh, heavens as in the heavenlies which is referring to the spiritual realm that and many times we think about it as something lying you know it, it, it kind of overlaps uh, but it is not talking about the natural heavens, the cosmic heavens, but as in the heavenlies, right? So this is, you know, Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual, you know, wicked spirits in heavenly realms, heavenlies. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. So 
this is talking about the the second heaven is talking about the spiritual unseen realm that also covers the earth so this is where the realm in which demon spirits operate so the wicked spirits operate so paul refers to it so that's the second heavens the third heavens is the realm in which god lives it is a realm into which in which paradise exists it is a realm into which a believer when he dies goes into so these are the three heavens is that okay yes thank you yeah. welcome thanks selena back to you thank you christopher for your uh, question thank you pastor for uh, answering uh, the question for those valuable insights uh, we'll move on to samuel's uh, question that he's posted on the chat section samuel says the three strike rule has often come up in the courses this semester and not just while doing church administration I understand it is something that only we as a church is agreed upon. It is definitely very high standards that we can think of adhering to, but it is also unsettling to know that we uh, could potentially lose our leader over three errors. Uh, should there be a system of resolution, personal and professional growth, etc., over something seemingly so rigid? And then he, uh, there's another. Uh, um, uh, query that uh, Samuel has posted, perhaps a seven times 77, se 70 times seven rule over three strikes, but with systems to ensure we are learning and uh, growing. So, uh, okay. anyone? I, I will uh, take it up because that three strike rule is part of uh, church and ministry administration. Uh, yeah, so Sam, uh, everything has a context in which it is presented. So the three strike rule is not something that applies to like everybody. No, it's it's in the context of uh, you know church administration. We're talking about church staff. So honestly, every person gets innumerable chances in the context of hey making small mistakes. Yeah, we all make mistakes, and there's no account for it. You know, um, uh, that's that's just not in matter. So. You know, I sometimes might forget to attend a meeting or I might forget to, you know, do something on time. So those are non-issues, right? Those are, you know, and, and that happens to all of us. So the three strike rule has a context. The context is when a staff fails to, you know, meet certain standards and expectations, then uh, and remember, something preceding the three strike rule is there is always constant warning saying, hey, this is not happening, so please get your work up to, you know, up to thing. Then we give first feedback, then a second. And then the third time the same matter repeats, it's the end. So these have to do with very consequential matters, you know, things like character issues, financial integrity, conduct, those are the things. The everyday non issues, we, you know, those are innumerable. We always, you know, uh, small, small matters we don't. So I think the, the context of three strike rule is very serious matters. Either work performance is not up to the mark, they're not delivering on what has to happen. So we're giving them three chances, which is fair enough. You can't keep paying a salary indefinitely, right? That's, that's not, that's not, that's unfair to the organization. So that's so there is uh, uh, the context is there a church staff somebody who's being paid for their work or even a volunteer uh, if there's a misconduct something very serious grievous then there is this three strike rule but sometimes like I also mentioned uh, termination will happen immediately on the first instant when there's a serious thing the three strike doesn't apply because the 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 misdeed was grievous. You know, if somebody's caught stealing money, we're not going to give them two more chances to steal money. <laughs> it's like that instant they're out. You know, uh, or if somebody, uh, uh, you know, physically or sexually abuses somebody, we're not going to give them two more chances. That instant they have to step down. You know, if they go through a process of correction, may maybe in the future we can bring them back to ministry. But there's no second or third chance. The three strike rule doesn't even apply. It's once and it's out you know so there's a context you know which all of these things happen and hopefully uh, you know we'll be sensitive to that yeah hope it's okay sam 
Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Back to you, Celine. Sorry, that was from my course, so that's why I answered it. No, thank you so much, Pastor. Uh, thank you, Samuel, for your question. I hope uh, your question was answered. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, question from Jack and uh, Joel. Uh, Jack and says, uh, sometimes I don't understand the difference between the burden which God places in my heart and the anxiety worry that comes in so subtly. As humans, we keep praying for many years about certain things. We leave it in faith, trusting in God, being persistent in faith. But there are times we see circumstances rising against things going in the opposite direction. Is this human fear, anxiety or burden which God has put in my heart to pray more fervently? What should be my right heart attitude? Would one of our uh, faculty uh, like to take on this question and answer uh, Jackin and help her with this? Okay, uh, thank you, Pastor Selina, and thank you, uh, uh, Jacqueline, for that uh, question. So I'll share my thoughts on this. Um, uh, when we talk about a burden that we receive from the Lord, uh, you know, when, when we receive something like that from the Lord, it leads us into um, uh, action, okay, some sort of an action. It's, and it's a healthy thing, receiving a burden from the Lord. For example, um, when we, uh, I, I'm just, uh, there are different examples we can look at, but uh, I'm just going to talk about Nehemiah. When he heard about um, the city's broken down walls, it was a concern that uh, came upon his heart and he was stirred up by that. We read uh, about that in Nehemiah chapter 2. But then uh, it was a healthy thing because he knew, um, also he knew how to channelize it. So when he felt that concern and that burden, um, he flung into action. And that was to pray initially. And then the Lord led him, gave him favor. And then he was actually able to go and do something about that situation. So uh, I feel a burden works in that way where we receive it and then there is uh, something productive coming out of it and it's healthy. Um, so, you know, either we pray uh, and then, you know, um, uh, take a step to move in the right direction. But then, um, you know, uh, some, as opposed to a burden, anxiety uh, is... Uh, Anxiety and worry, you know, we read about that in scripture. First um, Peter 5, 7, it says, cast your cares upon the Lord. So cares and anxiety, uh, I believe, fall uh, in the category where it's not healthy, it's not productive. Because, you know, it just leads us to a preoccupation where we don't, um, you know, invite God into that particular situation and, uh, you know, help. Uh, help us deal with it. So uh, that's the difference I see between these two, uh, Jashin. And uh, I would also say, uh, you've asked about certain uh, prayers that we keep praying, right? So yes, uh, you know, there are some situations, promises uh, from God, which have a right time for fulfillment. There are some promises for which we need to contend. So uh, such may take slightly longer uh, in, in, you know, manifesting, uh, but we must not give up. We must hold on to the word of God. God's word is our standard and we know that God's word is God's will. So, you know, we hold on to that and we continue in faith and continue in prayer to see the fulfillment of uh, those promises. So just some thoughts that I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, did that help, uh, Jackie? Okay. Thank you, Jacqueline, for your question. Uh, uh, the next uh, request we have is from Rajesh. She says, can I have a physical copy of uh, courses of study uh, for each semester? It will be easier to refer during the class. And uh, Pastor Ashish has uh, replied to that. Uh, he says, dear Rajesh, we apologize. We do not uh, mail print copies of lecture notes uh, to students, we however encourage students to print out their own personal copy of the lecture notes. Uh, some of our course, uh, courses uses the APC books as textbooks. Uh, within India, you can request your free copy of APC books by sending an email uh, with your postal address to book request at apcwo.org. Is that okay, Brother Rajesh? Yes, thank, thank you very much. 
Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our next uh, uh, question. Uh, it's from Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine is from Uganda. Uh, and she says, thank you very much for the e-learning platform. It has been a blessing and an eye-opener. My question is concerning praise and worship. How can one effectively lead uh, true worship? So can I ask uh, Pastor Roshan Johannes to answer that question, please? Thank you. Hi, Pastor Salim Aishwam. Thank you. Um, yeah, just want to clarify uh, this question very quickly is, uh, hi Jasmine, um, so is your question is re related to leading in worship, uh, is that right? Would that Hello. Be yes. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. So uh, effectively leading in true worship uh, or leading worship uh, corp corporately uh, you know, in a co or for a congregation uh, setting, uh, it it it's an overflow of what happens in the in, in the in your in your personal time in your personal time with God, uh, um, and so how to effectively lead through uh, worship? Um, it's simply building the in intimate relationship with Him, uh, worshiping uh, God in your private uh, in, in in your personal time, and just getting to learn going deeper uh, in in His Word. That's one thing. Going deeper in in the Holy Spirit, um, you know, just getting to uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit even more, and and the other thing I would say is uh, serving. So these three things actually kind of keeps our heart in check and also uh, helps us lead effectively uh, to our congregation. So first thing is go deeper in the Word of God mm -hmm. and go deeper in the Holy Spirit, like you know, praying in tongues, uh, you know, in the quiet times, and just worshiping, singing songs, and singing singing in tongues. And the third thing, I, the reason I say serving is. Uh, the people that you are leading should know you as well. So especially as uh, after you lead worship um, in the church or whatnot, uh, wherever uh, God uses you, uh, it's very important to stay back, connect with the people that you are leading, uh, and so you know, and so they know who the leader is as well. Um, it's not that you lead worship and you disappear, and the, the next thing, the next time they see you is only on stage again on a, next Sunday or once a month, whenever, right? So having that conversation, uh, just building that rapport, that relationship with the people in the congregation that you lead is also uh, another practical way of how you can effectively, uh, how you can be effective in leading worship as well. So I hope that answers. And Pastor Jake, if there's anything that you'd like to add. Uh, hi, Roshan. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, just some practical aspects. I just wanted to point out to one scripture, which is John chapter 4 and uh, verses um, 23 and 24, where the woman at the well asks the Lord, uh, has this conversation with the Lord, and the Lord um, kind of gives a you know, uh, a formula, uh, not formula, but then, you know, a focus on what true worship is and uh, what true worshipers uh, will do. So he says, uh, let me just read. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the uh, Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and fr truth. So um, if we keep that um, in front of us, you know, saying that, um, okay, as, I, as a worshipper, as a lead worshipper, if I worship the Lord in spirit and truth, you know, nothing superficial. It's not a performance, but I'm worshiping him out of my innermost being as led by the spirit of God and in truth, you know, without any hypocrisy, without any pretense, um, uh, in truth, meaning as per the word of God, worshiping him for who he is and you know, uh, so when I when I do that in my personal times, and when I facilitate the congregation, you know, when people are there, and I lead them into it, and <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, and leading the congregation into a time of worship is a it's like a journey. It's a progression. Uh, we are at the outer courts, and then we move in, and then slowly make our way. You know, if you have the picture of the tabernacle in front of you, uh, we go in um, to the you know, the most holy place. Um, so it's it could be some outer court, uh, you know, we could be singing some outer court songs um, about the Lord. And then slowly we, we, in your, you know, if you're having a song list or a set list, um, um, you could 
choose songs which move progressively from you know songs about god to songs to him you know so uh, we are we are saying something about him and then we move on to directly communing with him uh, i mean this is just a formula i mean this is just a guideline you don't have to strictly adhere to it but it helps because um, sometimes people are uh, kind of uh, distracted thinking about various things and yeah. then it helps to uh, bring that focus in to um, you know talk about the lord and then you talk to him <clears throat> and then you you know begin to commune uh, with him um, so if you can just think of that journey and um, and the thing is, uh, when we think about leading also, sometimes we think, okay, I have to tell people what to do all the time. Uh, it's not that. We just have to turn our focus onto the Lord and then, you know, the people begin communing and then we just step back. Uh, like Paul Belosha says, you know, we are lead worshippers. We lead, but then we are worshipping ourselves. And hope that helps. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Uh, did that help, Jasmine? I hope did that answered your yes, question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to our next query that's come from uh, Abraham. Abraham says, uh, please, I want to come to India next year for graduation. Uh, what is the procedure? So uh, Pastor Ashi says, uh, replied to your query. He says uh, that you need to apply at the Indian consulate close to you for a tourist or a visitor visa. You can then plan to attend uh, the graduation when you are here. But please note that you will not be allowed to engage in any Christian ministry work when you're on a tourist or a visitor visa because the Indian government is very strict about this. Uh, so did this help uh, Abraham, Tete? Yes, Pastor. Thank you so much, Pastor. But Thank I you. wanted to know, is it possible to receive an invitation letter from APC? Is that okay? Or I should just come with a tourist visa? Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, Abraham, it's better that you come on a tourist visa. Um, the thing is, um, at the present time, the situation in India is very, you know, especially when it comes to religious matters, things are very... Um, so if you say you're coming for big for a Bible college or you give any indication that way, they you know they will either just stop you from coming or uh, will not and will not give you a visa. So it's better not to mention you know uh, and just to come in as a tourist, then you attend you, you of course when once you're in here you can attend church services, do what you want with your time uh, other than being you know preaching and doing ministry. so now our suggestion is uh, just come as a tourist, and uh, rather than uh, you know uh, with this uh, mention with with trying to mention that you're coming for a Bible college graduation or something, it's better not to have any religious uh, mention of any religious activity. Okay, Pastor. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, we'll move on to our next question from John Paul. John Paul uh, uh, has uh, posted his question on the chat section. He says, when we listen to people from church, how do we keep from overburdening ourselves? So uh, you mean when people come and share their uh, problems and difficulties or come for prayer? Uh, is that what uh, yes, Pastor. you're asking, John? Yes. Okay. Uh, can one of our faculty answer this, please? Uh, when when we listen to people from church, how do we keep from overburdening ourselves? Okay, uh, thank you, John, for that question. I'll share some thoughts, and I'm sure the others also uh, you know, will have uh, much to say about this matter. Um, so some of the things that uh, could help is when we listen to people, uh, you know, we, we could be very sensitive to the voice of God as well. Like, uh, just keep asking the Lord, okay, Lord, how do I respond to this? How can I minister? How can I strengthen, counsel, encourage this person? Uh, and so, you know, as we hear from the Lord, we, we can uh, 
share that with them and uh, to uh, have a mindset where uh, you know we we think of empowering them so um, maybe equip them uh, in the word or something like that because sometimes in some situations what happens we give a listening ear and then uh, uh, there isn't much change and then constantly the sessions keep happening so you know you you end up uh, giving the same kind of time without really empowering that person so obviously you know uh, th that that is not a very effective way of listening to them so listen and see uh, how best we can empower them maybe uh, equip them from the word and or connect them to uh, uh, if if it requires uh, uh, somebody more professional or experienced uh, uh, you, to guide them then maybe we can connect them to a person like that so that's also something we can do uh, and uh, i feel uh, another thing we can think of john is um, see at the end of the day uh, you know thank god for the experience and the empowering of the holy spirit in our lives but we're all we're also human so uh, we may not have all the answers for all the questions that come our way so somewhere there is that limitation so don't um, be too hard on yourself if you feel uh, you know overwhelmed that oh uh, there's so many things happening and uh, everything needs a solution uh, but there's do let's do our best let's do our best uh, but even then you know, we might find that it's it's quite a lot to to handle so uh, in in that situation we have to also have a a, a boundary a healthy boundary so that we can maintain our own personal strength uh, and our own you know like uh, mental mental strength so just some thoughts from me uh, i request our colleagues also to please add thank you Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Would like, any of the other pastors like to uh, help John with his question? Yes, uh, Serena, I'd just like to add one single thought. Uh, uh, the verse uh, John 8.36 has really helped me where it says that, uh, so if the sun sets you free, is free indeed. Uh, now, uh, it's true that, especially in the pastoral calling, a lot of them come and share uh, all of their problems and all the challenges that they're going through. But I like what uh, Pastor Nancy also mentioned. A burden causes us to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a call to action. So John, yes, there will be times, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, many of them are coming and sharing their challenges. And, uh, and one thing that has helped me is to stand on this verse, John 8, 36, where, uh, you know, you, you're free. You're, there's this freedom, yet uh, when people are sharing and, uh, and you know, uh, they're, they're sharing their burdens and their challenges that they're going through, uh, of course, you stand on that word saying, uh, I know the sun has set us free. And then you uh, begin to minister to them in a way that letting them know that hey, this is the outcome or this, this can be, this is the future. We know that these challenges are there. And so personally for our, ourselves, uh, something that can really help us is even in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and supplication. So these are probably verses, uh, you know, uh, that many a times we have shared with people that I've realized that I've not applied it to myself. Uh, and so uh, I intentionally apply these things to myself and we are able to share it with others. It becomes more effective. So I just thought I would leave us with that. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Paul, for sharing uh, those insights. So did that help, John? Or Pastor Ashish, uh, you yes, like to share? Yes. John, one thing that helps me is, uh, I mean, I think, thanks for Nancy and Paul for sharing. One thing that helps me is just to remind myself that I'm not God, right? God didn't call us to play God. That means we are not here to solve people's problems. Uh, we are not here to be an answer to everything. That's only God can be God. Uh, we do our part. That is, you know, they come for counsel, you give your counsel. They come for prayer, you pray. Uh, God is the healer. We are not the healers. God is the comforter. We are not the comforters. Uh, God is the deliverer. We are not the deliverers, right? We are just instruments. Uh, like Paul says, you know, we are earthen vessels. So just to remind ourselves, God is not expecting me to solve their problems. I'm only a minister. I'm only a channel. So 
every time our confidence is complete in God. God, I've spoken what I need to speak. The rest is yours. You know, I can't do God's part. God is not expecting me to do his part. So that way I'm not carrying any burden. You know, after I meet the person, the matter is over. I don't I don't talk about that matter. I don't think about that matter. So let's say somebody comes to me, they, I usually give about 50 minutes to one hour. They come, they may say everything. When we close with prayer, the matter is closed. I don't go talk about that person, don't think about that person, don't discuss the matter again. I don't keep it in my mind. That's not my responsibility. Uh, I, and I shouldn't, right? That means that matter has been cast before the Lord when we close in prayer. Now it's entirely God's thing to handle. I'm no longer involved in it, unless, of course, I need to pray for them, pray for that person. To that extent, yes, we are involved. Uh, we carry that sense of care and, you know, quote unquote, burden for them. That we should pray for them, but we are not God. We are not trying to solve the problems. Only God can do that. So that really helps me. Just hey, stay out of God's way. <laughs> Let God do it. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Nancy and Pastor Paul. Really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, we'll move on to the next question from Reverend Kennedy from Kenya. He says, it's, it's normal as a pastor to feel withdrawn. Uh, you feel like you are being used, especially when you see the people you think are mature, are, uh, uh, are behaving as baby Christians. You have talked to them, prayed with them about you have talked to them, prayed with them, but no change. What do you do? Uh, can Pastor Jay Kumar answer this question, please? Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, um, so I think there are two things mentioned here. Um, is it normal for a pastor to feel withdrawn? Um, so I guess emotionally detached from, um, like, I, I, I'm just trying to understand, I guess it's, uh, anyway, let me just answer that, uh, feel withdrawn from whatever is happening. Now, um, I think we just need to uh, check why we are feeling withdrawn. Is it because of too much of things happening, problems? Uh, maybe we are we're feeling discouraged or maybe we don't see things happening. Uh, as it should, and uh, you know, we kind of uh, feeling withdrawn because of that. Um, okay, and then you've clarified. You feel you are being used, especially you see people you think are mature behaving as baby Christians. Okay, so um, again, uh, just going back to um, uh, you know, uh, 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 just understanding that uh, it is a journey that we are making as a community of believers, and uh, well, there are people. Um, some people take more time than others to mature. And to grow, and if you look at our own lives, yes, you know we we understand that. So um, it requires patience, but also requires um, uh, it requires empowering people. Uh, I just share that uh, you know because uh, people uh, not only um, uh, need to know what's wrong, but also uh, and what is right and what they need to do, but also they need to know how to get there and um, uh, empowering the people through the word and the spirit and giving them the keys um, to handle certain things um, would really help. Um, so, yeah, so maybe if you've counseled, maybe we have, um, you know, prayed with them. Um, but still, they are not um, able to, they, we don't see visible change. So it's, it's good to understand why, you know, is it the attitude problem? Or are they genuinely trying and they are unable to? Or, you know, have we failed to give them the keys for change? You know, maybe like renewing the mind or, you know, praying in the spirit or some a discipline of uh, uh, going to the Lord. Or are they just running to the pastor every time they have a, you know, a problem or a challenge? Um, so what is it? So I think to understand uh, that situation and to help them, um, empower their hands, empower them to live that out uh, would really uh, help. I hope that helps. Uh, anyone else can add to this? Thank you, Pastor Jay Kumar. Uh, did that help uh, Reverend Kennedy? Yes, yes, I think uh, I've gotten something. Okay. 
Uh, we'll move on. To, uh, thank you, Reverend Kennedy. We'll move on to Rajesh's uh, question. Uh, he says, I may be missing many live sessions, such as Holy Spirit sessions, anointing sessions, impartations, prayer. How can we connect with APC? Uh, Brother Rajesh, the, uh, all of the uh, mentoring sessions that we have are recorded. It's posted uh, uh, in, in the main Audi section, so you can go back and refer to uh, those sessions. Thank you very we don't much. we don't record the uh, uh, we don't have pre the prayer sessions that happen for in person students and uh, uh, that's not recorded because they have it uh, every Friday the supernat or every day supernatural hour every Friday they have their fa fasting prayer but that's not uh, for uh, the rest of the e learning students and online students uh, so that's not recorded but you can uh, you know access all the uh, uh, mentoring sessions uh, that's either that will be posted on the in the Audi, the main Audi page. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, we just run out of time. So, uh, Jeremiah's um, uh, question, I think Pastor has uh, responded. Uh, I see uh, Christopher's hand up and even uh, Lamax. Uh, 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 hand up, uh, but since we've run out of time, I would request both of you to uh, please post your question, uh, uh, send it to the administrator, and uh, you know, email it to her, and then we will address those uh, questions. Is that okay, Christopher and Lamek? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, because we've run out of time, uh, we have to, uh, you know, uh, and students have to get ready for the class and even the faculty. So uh, we'll stop here. Uh, thank you all for joining the mentoring session. Um, uh, I see Jasmine's question as well. Jasmine, we will address your question. We'll uh, reply it uh, via email to you. Uh, you can send in uh, uh, your questions at uh, admin at apcbiblecollege.org and we'll answer uh, those of you who've not been able to answer ask your questions or if your uh, questions have hello. been posted and not yeah, been answered we can do that yes hello this this is lamek yes lamek yeah well uh, mine actually is the mainly a token of appreciation it's nice really to uh talk to you guys and uh, especially Pastor Raika, she's so you have been a blessing to our family and uh, yeah, many others. So we, by God's grace, we've started actually some kind of school, and we are really encouraging all our students to join the Bible College. So we are using the material, the foundations, and the rest actually to do our small groups we've called them uh, we are calling them life families so it's really such a blessing actually we see that uh, uh we have a spiritual buffet we call it a spiritual buffet so for all the material and everything it's such a blessing and we are seeing really that it, it's a revival really happening and uh, we keep praying for you guys and uh, yeah, let God continue to use you mightily. So, Pastor uh, Raika Ashisi, so thank you, thank you so much. We are being blessed. We will keep in touch. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you, you Lamek. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Lamek. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for joining the mentoring uh, session. Uh, have a blessed uh, day and a week ahead. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Okay, please, yeah.